So what are we really talking about with consciousness? We've sort of talked about emotion, we've dismissed instinct, we see that's not really valid anymore, we have this sort of chemical responses and light responses of things like the cephalopods. What do we really mean by saying an animal is conscious? I mean, Franz, in your book, you actually don't really get to it until the final chapter. Yeah, yeah. The consciousness is a term that was partly invented to set humans apart, I think, and that's why it's so ill-defined. So, so it doesn't have a good definition and no one tells us how to measure it. And then they say, well, only humans have consciousness. And then if I don't know how to measure it, I have no idea what they mean. Um, but if you bring it down to the most basic level, consciousness would also be that you um, experience, so, so it has to do with sentience. You experience feelings, you experience the environment. And, and in that sense, a snake or a fish clearly has some level of consciousness. So they do experiments, for example, on crabs. One experiment that was done, you put crabs in a tank and you, you shine a bright light on them. They go into hiding. You shock them into certain, in certain places where they hide, you shock them. <coughs> and very soon they learn to avoid these places, which is proof that they have a pain experience. Uh, now, pain was one of these issues. Uh, fish had no pain. Arthropods had no pain. Even human babies had no pain at some point. You could do whatever you wanted with a human baby. Uh, maybe not killing it, but otherwise you could do basically everything. So, so people pain... did experiments on babies, yeah. believing that they could prove that they did not feel pain. I yeah. mean, it's, uh, it's kind of shocking. It's but... shocking. And it's, it's because they don't talk. So as, as soon as you can talk and say, well, that was very painful, um, we believe yeah. that you have pain, but the snake, of course, cannot do that. But, but clearly all animals, uh, certainly animals with brains, they have pain sensations. So, so on that level of consciousness is definitely there. Yeah, and I think historically we've connected thinking or thought with language. It's because if we can express it, we can say, yes, it exists. And that's been one of the big problems. But I she think was just, sorry, yeah, sorry. she was just scolding my dog for offering itself as food <laughs> to the new boa. I mean, what if consciousness is more widespread in the animal world than we thought? What if our whole starting point has been wrong, thinking we're the only conscious creatures? What's that? What if that's okay, the norm well, and it's just distributed you know, in different quantities or different degrees. Well, this is exactly, I mean, I think the subtext of a lot of this conversation, which is where we really need to get to, which is what are we doing to animals, you know, and, and what is our responsibility towards animals? And I know, Diana, that you are very involved with the film The Cove, um, which is a devastating film about the slaughter of dolphins. Um, and, um, and so what is our responsibility to animals, whether they're conscious or not, do we really need to justify our behavior by arguing they feel no pain, they have no consciousness? They're yeah. automata. Yeah, I, it's a big issue. I'm actually involved in animal welfare science more than animal rights. I think there's a little bit of a difference. Uh, we share a lot of the same concerns, but I think in the animal welfare approach, we, we try to apply what we know about animals to better to, to, to their care and to making policy decisions. Um, I think that in... If you take most people and say, do you want me to cause pain and suffering to this animal? They probably would say no. That's in a perfect world. But if it's a matter of eating a hamburger in front of you that looks really good and saying, I'm never going to kill another cow to get it, how many people are going to give that up? Right now, there's a movement to not do factory farming of the octopus because of cognitive work that's been done by several people. Those people who've done the work are pushing not to do this kind of factory farming. And factory farming has terrible effects on animals, from salmon to other creatures. But it's what we, we're doing as a species so that we can get some kind of food. So will we give things up in the name of better welfare for these animals? And I think that's the question. Franz, I know that you've talked about this also at the end of your book. You didn't advocate for vegetarianism or um, you know, extreme reactions, but I'd love to hear your opinion on this because I know that your concern is about also animal welfare. 
Yeah, for, for me, the, the issue is how we treat animals. It's not so much whether we eat them or not, but how we treat them. And um, my solution to the problem would be transparency. I feel there's a lot of stuff going on with animals that we never get to see in, in for example, the agricultural industry. So what I would want to see is that we, we have transparency in the sense that if, if you buy a piece of meat in, in the supermarket, you can have a scan bar and you can see videos and photos of actually how this animal, this specific animal, by an independent agency, not by the farmer, how that animal is kept. And then you can make informed decisions. Do I still want to eat that animal, yes or no? I think we probably need to go down to 50% of what we eat in terms of meat to improve the conditions. And, and hopefully in, let's say, 15 years, 20 years, we will have all these alternatives coming up, which are already coming up at this point, so that maybe at some point we can do away with the whole operation because it's, um, it's also ecologically a disaster, all this intensive farming that's going on.